Oh, I love the 80s. Right kid made everybody want to fight in school. Everybody thought they knew Kung Fu back back then, thinking they Bruce Lee, when they couldn't even touch Daniel's son. People thought I looked like Johnny Lawrence, William Zapka. He always had a freaking thing around his head. Like, what was up with that? Like, he wore that to school, you know? Mr. Miyagi, he was the man. Wax on, wax Once off, breathe in, breathe out. Finish him! I mean, come on, seriously. I could fight that. E.T. phone home. E.T. phone home. With the longest neck I ever seen. I mean, dang, man, I mean, he, he scared me when I was a little kid. Just like he scared Drew Barrymore. <laughs> and he pointed at you and his light, his finger glow. And talking about phone home. There is one movie that I will watch all the time continuously. If it's on TV, it'll be back to see Charles. First of all, the title, extremely confusing. Just give it a minute, it'll sink in. Back to the future. Where's my hoverboard? Hoverboard? Hoverboard, this is the year 2010. Hoverboard still ain't come out yet. I want a hoverboard. Back to the Future is timeless. <laughs> if that went over your head, I'm sorry. I love the 80s. What's up, New Spring Church? I want to welcome all of our campuses today. I think the one movie that we left out of that was Raiders. The Lost Ark, my personal favorite 80s movie. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's good. Hey, listen, we had what we would call a historic weekend last weekend on every one of our campuses. Let me just kind of walk you through. 518 people surrendered their lives to Christ, and we can celebrate that. We had, we had major problems at every campus. We... Uh, we ran out of parking at the Anderson campus. Greenville had people everywhere. We ran out of seats in Columbia. Florence had over 1,000 people. We had um, emails sent into the office this week of people that received Christ watching on the web. It was an unbelievable weekend. And one of the things we want to do today in finishing up the 80 series, which, by the way, has probably been one of my most favorite series we've ever ever done in the history of our church, um, largely because of music. But anyway, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that I want to try to do today is answer the question that a lot of well-meaning Christians or, or church people ask about when, when we have a large number of people receive Christ, that one of the common most asked questions is, what do you do with those people? And, and I understand the question, I understand the mentality, but the, the, most, um, the best answer that we give is we do church. That's, that's what we do because one of the things we've got to understand as a body of believers is discipleship is not a program, it's a process. You did not become the follower of Christ that you are because you went through a particular program. Because, because discipleship isn't like microwave popcorn. You take the bag and you put it in the microwave and in three minutes you have popcorn. Discipleship is a process. And so what we do for people that come to Christ is we trust the same Holy Spirit that brought them to Christ will continue to lead them in a walk with Christ. And one of the best things that we can do for those people is every week we're going to do church just like we're doing today. Let me, um, let me set it up like this. Uh, I used to work out at a gym uh, in Anderson 
And now I kind of work out in my basement. I kind of do my own thing. I got a little P90X thing going. Tried Insanity once. Um, I'm not doing that. But one of the things that I used to do is go to a gym. And if you work out at a gym, you understand, usually the same people come in the same time of day. Well, I was a morning guy. And there was a guy that used to come into the gym every morning. Now, listen, for three years... For three years, I watched this man. Actually, he was usually there before I got there. He would get there around 5.30. Um, he would be there when I got there, and he would be there when I left. I later found out that his pattern was he would get there at 5.30, and he would leave at 7.30. He would literally spend two hours in the gym every morning. But here, here's the kicker. He never worked out. I never saw him on a treadmill. I never saw him on an elliptical. I never saw him lift a weight. All he did was walk from person to person and talk to people, sit down, read a paper. He never worked out. So in three years, in three years, there was never any visible sign that this dude ever went to the gym. Like nobody probably ever said to him, hey, you been working out? Now, I know that's probably not the nicest thing to say, but it's true. Even though he went to the gym every single day, just about for three years, you couldn't tell he had ever gone into the gym. Reminds me of some church people I know. The, the, I, one of the most confusing things about church when I first got into church is how somebody could attend church for 5, 10, 15, even 20 years and never change. Like, never changed. Like, they were the same mean, greedy, self-centered, egotistical person 20 years, from, from 20 years later than they were when they started attending church. And then I finally realized, and we've said this through this series, that there's a difference between attending church and following Jesus. And so we, during this series, we've kind, of, uh, we've kind of talked about our brand new core values, found people, find people, save people, serve people. I cannot do life alone. Today, we're going to cover the fourth core value. The fourth core value. If you've got your bulletin, you've got your, your notes, you're ready to take some notes, here we go. Here's the fourth core value. I want you to write this down. According to the scriptures, growing people change. According to the scriptures, growing people change. Change. I want to talk to our church today about that fact because, listen, one of the things I've discovered about Christ personally and through reading the scriptures is this. If you're not changing, you're not walking with Jesus because you and I cannot walk with Jesus and stay the same. If you and I are walking on a consistent basis with Jesus Christ, he is going to be changing something in us and around us and through us. And that doesn't matter if you've been following him for the past week or for the past 50 years. If you're walking with Christ, he's changing something in you, around you, and through you. Now, let me, let me kind of talk about it like this for a second. The Apostle Paul would probably be one of the top three Christians of all time. I mean, we could say that, right? I mean, if you're ranking them, you got like Peter, Paul, and, and Mary. No, Peter, Paul, Peter, Paul, that's a great group. Peter, Paul, and let's just say Paul. Let's just go with Paul. So Paul's probably one of the top three because Paul pulled off some incredible stuff. Um, in fact, Paul did some things that most of us have not done. Like, for example, Paul brought people back from the dead. Like, you think I'm long-winded sometime. Paul was preaching one night. He was so long-winded, a, a dude fell out the window and died, and Paul went and brought him back to life and then continued to preach all night, which if you bring somebody back from the dead, you can, you can do that. Paul did that. Paul healed people. Um, Paul saw Jesus face-to-face -face on, on, on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. I mean, Paul pulled off some amazing things. So if anybody probably had achieved a level of spirituality where they didn't have to grow anymore, it would have been the Apostle Paul. That's why it's so fascinating for me when I'm reading through the book of Philippians and I get to this particular passage, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Now, we're going to cover a lot of Bible today, so, so don't, don't try to keep up, but Philippians, unless you were the Bible drill people, present, you know. So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. And th keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul writing this, okay? Now, I'm going to say that several times. Here we go. Verse 10 of Philippians chapter 3 says this. I want to know Christ. Hold on. 
You're Paul. You heal people. You brought people back from the dead. I mean, uh, you, you saw Jesus face to face. You're Paul. And Paul writes, I want to know Christ. Translation, if Paul felt like he didn't know Jesus like he needed to know Jesus, then probably all of us need to say the same thing. I want to know Christ. Then he says this, and the power of his resurrection. Now that's popular. This next part isn't popular. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, as so, as so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Now look at this. Look at this. This is Paul. Verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this. <laughs> You're Paul. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul said, I am walking with Christ, and as I press on with Christ, he is changing me and conforming me to become more like him. Now look at this. This, this is amazing. Brothers, I do not consider myself to yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, that's huge. I, I want to stop and camp on that for just a second. Forgetting what is behind, Paul's not talking about his bad past. Paul's talking about his religious past. Paul's like, I've had some great experiences in religion. I've had some great experiences with God. But one of the problems in the church world today is somebody can go on a mission trip and they'll pat themselves on the back for 10 years thinking they accomplished something significant for Jesus. I'm all about the mission trip. But our life is a mission trip. People will give a special offering and they'll pat themselves on the back for the rest of their life thinking that they did something great for God when we actually just gave him back what he gave to us in the first place. And Paul's going, hey, I've had some experiences with God that have blown your mind, but I'm forgetting that because I'm pressing on, I want to know him more. Translation, growing people change. He said this, forgetting what is behind and straining. In other words, there's some effort here. I'm not growing in my relationship with Jesus. What kind of effort are you putting into it? Straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Growing people change. Now, we're going to take a lot of notes. I'm going to go really fast. If you're looking in your bulletin, you're going to notice that there are lots and lots and lots of scripture verses under each point. I'm not going to cover each scripture verse. Some of y'all were absolutely freaking out, thinking we're going to read all those. Those verses are for you to take back home and look up in your Bible and highlight and underline and memorize that just kind of go along with a point. I'm about to cover seven ways, seven things that I believe that you and I can do to practically grow in our faith with the Lord. Now, let me be very quick. The seven things I'm about to share have nothing to do with God's love for you. You could, listen, God's love for us is not based on our performance. It's based on what we talked about last week, Jesus on the cross paying for our sins. You don't have to do these things to get God to love you. In fact, I would say God's love for us is never in question. It's usually our love for him. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to unpack seven things that we can practically do if we really want to experience change on what I would call a consistent basis. We're going to take a lot of notes. We're going to go really fast. Here we go. Number one, read your Bible. Man, I should go on to number two right there, but, but, but I'm, I'm going to stop because it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me because, listen, I've been in church world now for 20 years, and it's amazing to me the number of people in the church that will claim they want to hear God's voice, but will never open God's word. Mind-blowing. And, and then people tell me, well, I don't have time. Usually that's men. And I'm like, the reason you don't have time is because you've watched the same episode of Sports Center three hours in a row. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. You've watched the same news program for four hours in a row. They said the same thing they said the night before. Read your Bible. Now, let me be very quick. A lot of people go, well, I need God's direction, so I'm going to read the Bible. You've never read the Bible and God said, go to that school. 
Take that job. I want to be very clear. We don't read the Bible in order to discover what to do. We read the Bible to discover who God is. Because you and I will never do what he's called us to do if we don't understand who he is. If we want to really grow in our faith in in Christ, we've got to understand who God is. And let me say this, you and I cannot fully understand who God is if we're not reading his word. Scripture says this in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. A lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What is that? What God's word is a lamp and a light? Who, who, like, is it giving us direction? No, it's giving us, it's, it's focusing our direction on who God is. So if you really, really, really want to grow in your faith, begin to read the Bible. Now, I know the objection here, because because I've, I've been here. As people go, Perry, I don't, know, I don't know where to read the Bible. And some people go, I'm going to start in Genesis. Well, that's great. Leviticus is going to freak you out if you've never read the Bible. I'm just going to go ahead and say they start killing goats and bulls. And, and it, it, it gets really, and people like freaking out over the, the, the goat and stuff. And so I'm telling you, I would not recommend that. I know some people that start with Revelation and then they can't sleep at night. And, and I don't even know what that stuff, you know, people, what does the book of Revelation mean? It means the revelation is this, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's all I know. Okay, I don't even know what that is. And it, the, people go, well, I'm going to read this and I'm just going to open up the Bible and see whatever. And it's, you open it, it's like Judas hanged himself. And you're like, crap, I need to cl- you close it and you open it again. It says, go and do likewise. And you're like, crap, I don't even. I, I'm just saying that I don't think that's the most effective way. So for those of you here going, well, I want to read the Bible, but I don't know where. And in every campus, listen, when you leave today, we got a 21-day 21 reading, 21 reading plan. We've got a 100-day reading plan. We've got a six-month reading plan. And we've got a 365-day reading plan in every one of our lobbies. If you don't have a Bible, that, this, this is legit if you don't have a Bible. It doesn't mean I've got four in my car, five in my home, and I can't find any of them. If you legitimately don't have a Bible, we'll give you one. And in every one of our lobbies, on every one of our campuses today, you can pick up one of these reading plans. I'm telling you, if you want to grow in your faith, listen, I'll just say this. I don't know of one single person that's walking with Jesus on a consistent basis that's not in the Word on a daily basis. Read your Bible. Number two, baptism. Baptism. I just, I just want to say this. I'm going to hit it and move. I just want to say the first thing Jesus commands, and let me stop real quick and say this. Jesus has never asked anyone to do anything. He is almighty God. When he speaks, he's not requesting, he's commanding. The first thing Jesus commands of people when they identify with him and agree to follow him is for them to follow through in a public ceremony called baptism. This is what the scriptures say in in, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Stop. If you're a follower of Christ, that means Jesus has all authority in your life. That means whatever he says to start doing, you start doing it. It means whatever he says to stop doing it, stop doing, you stop doing it. He has all authority. Well, look at this. The first thing he asks us to do, verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Well, what happens when someone has made a disciple? Look at this. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to stop right there and say the first thing Jesus said to do is be baptized. So once you pray to receive Christ, you need to be baptized. Baptism in the Bible is after salvation by immersion. There is no other example. There are 27 references to baptism in the New Testament. Every reference to baptism is after salvation by immersion. If you were saved last week, if you prayed to receive Christ last week, and you go, well, Perry, I've already been baptized. I don't need to be baptized. Listen, if you were baptized before you met Christ, all you were was a wet sinner. You need to follow through in baptism. Now, some people go, well, my family will get mad, and I don't want to upset my family. Listen, if you come from another tradition, I completely get that. But Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, and I will divide the family. And you just got to just gotta decide, do I want to honor my parents more, or do I want to honor Jesus more? And I'm not talking to the teenagers. 
I'm not talking to the teenagers because teenagers are called to honor their father and mother. I'm talking to the people in their 30s and 40s and 50s that don't want to get baptized because mama might get mad. Who did you agree to follow, mama or Jesus? Baptism is a command. You need to be baptized. So on every one of our campuses in your bulletin, you got this little thing that says baptism, sign up. If you prayed to receive Christ last week, you need to sign up for baptism. We're baptizing on September 12th, September 19th, and September 26th. Every Sunday, every service, every campus, you put your name, your birth date, your address, your city, state, zip code, phone, email, and when you want to be baptized, what date, and someone will contact you as to the service time. Listen, this isn't something you pray about. This is something you do. Jesus clearly commanded it in the Word of God. Baptism. Number three, regular church attendance. Notice I did not say church once a month. I said regular church attendance. Regular church attendance. My, uh, one of my best friends, Clayton King, has one of some of the most unusual experiences ever. And um, this is a true story. It's a little gross. It might make some of you throw up, but that's all right. Um, we'll clean it up afterwards. We have an amazing team that cleans after every service. And um, he was, he was he heard a big commotion outside of his house one day. True story. And he went down and there was a car wreck. And he looked at this car wreck and a woman had been in a really bad car wreck and her arm had been completely severed from her body. Like the woman was here and the arm was like over here. And I asked Clayton, I was like, well, what'd you do, man? He's like, well, I went and got my cooler and I packed it full of ice and I put the arm on ice and sent it with the people and they attached the arm back to her and she was great. But, but like, what if Clayton would have said, you know what, I've been, I, I guess I've been needing an extra hand around here. I'll just take the arm with me. You know, because he's got two kids, so he's got like the third arm, and he's got one to kind of pull in. Well, and he can ride down the road. He can text and wave at the same time. What if he had just kind of kept that arm around for just good measure? Well, everybody knows that's stupid. Because everybody knows that if you detach a limb from the body, that limb will eventually die. The reason a lot of people who claim to follow Christ don't actually follow Christ is because they are nothing more than limbs attached, detached from the body. But the idea and the notion that you can follow Jesus on a consistent basis without being involved in a church goes against 2,000 years of church history and hundreds of verses of Scripture. You and I are called to regular church attendance. Regular church attendance. In fact, the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You and I are called to be involved in a church and attend on a regular basis. So where are you going to go? Like where are you going to plug in and attend? Because let me, let me, let me kind of hit a couple things. A lot of people will look at a church like New Spring and go, well, this is, this is too big. This is too big. Just a really quick question. I'm going to move on. Who really wants to keep the church small, Jesus or Satan? Like you want your bank account to grow, don't you? Like you've never looked at your bank account and went, oh, my gosh, I'm getting concerned about my bank account. It is too big. You know why? Because money's valuable to you. You know what's valuable to Jesus? People souls and when a church grows that means the kingdom is growing because they're focused on evangelism the only people that want the church to remain small are the people that do not have the things of god in mind and if the church is too big it tells me two things about you you're not in a group and you don't volunteer so i would say the church is called to grow larger and smaller at the same time a couple weeks ago i talked about groups some of you plugged in some of you did not if you have not plugged into a group, I would recommend that today you go by guest services and get plugged into a group. That's one of the ways to make sure the church is not too big. Well, another one of the things we hear around New Spring, because we do series a lot, and we'll be doing a particular series, and I've literally heard this. People will go, oh, I know what the message is going to be on today. I don't need to go. Let me just say this, and I'm going to say it very unapologetically but very directly. It is arrogant to assume that you know what God's Holy Spirit is going to do in your life through the preaching of his word because you know a sermon title. 
Man, we've done, we've done messages here at New Spring Church on tithing and people have gotten saved. What God does through the power of his Holy Spirit, through the preaching of his word, is unbelievable. That's why you and I are called to gather together regularly. So regular church attendance. Listen, I don't know anyone, anyone on the planet that's really walking with Jesus that's not going to church regularly. And I've had people push back going, what about the people in China? They sacrifice sometimes their lives to get to an underground church every weekend. I'm telling you, regular church attendance grows our faith in Christ. Number four, confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. The Bible actually says in James chapter 5 that one of the reasons a lot of people are not healed from their sickness is because they refuse to confess and repent their sin, of, of their sins. One of the things I say often around here, I've said it over the past several weeks, I want to say it again very clearly, is that Jesus is not after our behavior, he's after our hearts. One of the things that you can count on is Jesus coming after your heart and my heart. And one of the things the scriptures say very clearly, I just want to read through Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 1 through 5 and point something out. The Bible says this, some of the elders of Israel, and this is Ezekiel the prophet talking, came to me and sat down in front of me. This would be equivalent to like us going to church because they came to the prophet because the prophet would declare the word of God to them. Then the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, which was his nickname like for Ezekiel. These men have set up idols in their hearts. Remember what's he after? Not the behavior, but the heart. And put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Then he says this, Therefore speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him myself in keeping with his great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Here's the translation. If there's an idol in your heart and you go to church, the only thing you're ever really going to hear the preacher say is something having to do with your idol. That is why people can come to a church, and it doesn't matter what church, but we'll just use this one because this is the church I know best, and they can leave and say, well, all, all Perry ever talks about is having sex with your boyfriend. Well, that's probably because that's what you're doing. All Perry ever talks about is money. It's probably because I attacked your idol. All Perry ever talks about is serving. It's because time is your idol. You will always scream when a sore spot is hit spiritually. So when a person begins to scream about what a church is always talking about, they're not necessarily talking about that church. They're just simply exposing their heart. Jesus is after our hearts, not our behavior. And so the real question is, what is there in your life that's between you and Jesus that you need to confess to God and maybe to others and repent of? We've talked about several things over the past few weeks. Confession and repentance is necessary. I'll just say this. You can't follow Christ and be a butthole forever. Now, I said that in a group recently, and somebody murmured back to me, that's not true. It's because that's a butthole who thinks he's following Jesus. He is, Jesus is going to change our attitude, our hearts, our motivations. And if those things aren't changing, then we're not confessing and repenting. And if we're not confessing and repenting, we're not truly following Jesus. What is in your heart that he's coming after? Only you can answer that question. Confession and repentance. Number five, giving. Ha <laughs> ha! I love that one. Woo! Talk about giving for a second. Um, for the most part, Everybody watching the service today, unless you're watching online, is in the state of South Carolina. And we have a, a football rivalry in South Carolina. There's Clemson and Carolina. And some people like Carolina. And uh, they obviously didn't get saved last week. But some people like Carolina. And some people love God's team, the Clemson Tigers. See? There we got some people in here. Now, here, here's the thing. When Clemson and Carolina play, you can't. Be the, you, you can't say, well, I just kind of like both teams and I pull for both teams. No. You've got to pick one or the other. 
You can't say, well, I like Clemson. Like, if you're a true Clemson fan, because I've heard Clemson fans say this, well, I pull for South Carolina when they're not pulling for Clemson, then you're not a Clemson fan. Repent. Because Carolina fans don't do that. Now listen, if you truly pull for one team, then you've got to hate the other one. I know Columbia campus is getting happy right now because all y'all hate Clemson, except there's probably a few saints scattered among you. But listen, 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 listen. You can't say, I'll pull for both teams. Now, Jesus had something to say about that. He said a couple things. Let me, this, this is Jesus. I love his stuff. I don't know if y'all have read his book. It is unbelievable. He said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, he can't say that you're a truly a follower of him if your money's not going to him. By the way, that, that's talking about tithing. It's talking about offerings. Tithing is 10% to the house. Well, I just don't believe you've got to give your money to the church. Yeah, the only problem with that philosophy is the Bible. We'll talk more about that another time. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said this. No one can serve two masters. Like, you've got to pull for one, tell me the other. No, look what, look, this is Jesus now. This is Jesus. Don't get mad. Just go out and throw stuff up in the air. And come down and hit you in the head because you can't fight with Jesus, all right? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Then he said this. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus said that the number one competitor for our worship wasn't the devil, because that's what I would have said. I would have like, you got to pull for team God or pull for team devil? Mm -mm. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. Translation, money is the number one competitor for our hearts. So I would say this. If you haven't learned to faithfully give to God, then you haven't learned faith, how to faithfully follow him. For God so loved the world, he gave. If you're going to be like Jesus, you're not a taker, you're a giver. Number six, sharing Christ. Sharing Christ will grow your faith. Now, I, I got to say this. I am so proud of this church because we did an evangelism seminar several weeks ago. And honestly, I expected, I mean, I was really like, man, if we could have 2,000 people show up to be trained on how to share their faith, that would be a win. And between all of our campuses and online, we had over 4,000 people show up to learn how to be trained and share their faith. It was amazing. Man, I had a ball. And it's paying dividends. Literally, last week at the Anderson campus, I was leaving the campus. One of the Parkers stopped me. He was like, I was like, oh, I'm... I'm Pastor P. Like, I, why, why do I need to stop? He was like, so I stopped, and I rolled down the window, and he goes, hey, man, hey, man, I know, I know you're trying to get home. I just got to share this with you. Thank you for the evangelism seminar. Because of that, I led a friend of mine this week to Christ, and I wouldn't have had the courage to do it or the knowledge to do it had I not came to that evangelism seminar. Man, people are getting saved outside the walls. And that is awesome. I'm telling you, you and I will grow in our faith as we share Christ. Look at what Philemon said. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6. There's only one chapter in Philemon, by the way. He said, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Active, that means we do it. Active. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Why? So that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I think the reason a lot of people don't fully understand what we have in Christ is because they've never tried to explain it to somebody else. So, for those of you that went through the evangelism seminar, let me just ask you a couple questions. Have you written out your testimony yet? Have you practiced it with someone? Because I'm telling you, when you and I learn how to share our faith outside these walls and tell people about Jesus, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we wouldn't be able to build the buildings big enough to hold the people that are going to come in. So, and listen, if you missed the evangelism seminar, it's online. Go to our website, www.newspring.cc. You can watch the whole thing. You can go to iTunes and download the podcast. But sharing Christ will grow your faith. Last but not least, serving 
serving. Um, in ministry, preachers have this thing that we go through on Sunday nights and all day Monday called the Holy Hangover. Now, for those of you that have a background in maybe drinking a beer or 12 and you understand what a hangover is, it's, it's, it's most of the time where you're like, I can't believe I said that, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe I said that, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe I said that. Okay, I do that every week. Like Sunday nights, I'll be driving home going, I can't believe I said that, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe, oh my gosh, they're not coming back. And I'm just really excited when Lucretia comes back the next week. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We all experience the holy hangover. Well, a few weeks ago, I experienced the holy hangover because I stood on this stage and I said, we're purging the rolls. And we had some people get excited, but there were a couple of people that maybe got a little, just a little upset about that. And so I stood on the stage the next week and I said, we're purging the rolls. And even more people got upset. And I had some people pull me aside and say, I understand what you were saying, but the language that you used, the word purge, might not have been the best choice. And you know what? They were right. Because purging insinuates that we're kicking people out of the church. We had people calling going, you're going to kick me out of the church? Oh, listen, 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 listen. We're not kicking anyone out of the church. Now, let me, let me take that back. We have done church discipline according to Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and several other passages of Scripture, and we will do that. Maybe that's a whole other message for a whole other time, but we have done church discipline, and church discipline does require that from time to time you remove people from the role when they do not repent of sin. But there are people in this church that are not serving, and you got upset and had excuses and all that other stuff. And now I said purge, and so you thought you were going to get kicked out of the church. Let me just, let me just say this. We're not going to kick you out of the church. We're just going to move you from um, active member status to inactive member status. And some of you might push back and go, but I'm an active member. Uh -uh. Attendance does not equal involvement. We just moved you to an inactive member. Now, we wrestled through that. I wrestled through that. And I've had, you know, I've had people going, is that really the godly thing to do? Let me just read you this text of scripture. I'm not, I just read this, and this kind of, I don't know, maybe, I don't know what you think. Luke chapter 22, verse 19 to 20, the Bible says this about Jesus. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you i oh, stop how in the world can we look at a God who sent his son that gave his body and his blood who called us gifted us equipped us and empowered us and actually look at him and say, yeah, I can't give you an hour a month. Really? Really? I mean, come on. So in light of what Jesus gave to us, listen, I'm not asking, we're not asking you to volunteer every service, all service. We're saying, what can you give? What can you give? Because the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. Now, that's, I, I, just, I, I, know, I know that's Bible. I know that's Bible. That's what the Bible says. And so one of the things we understand is we're called to serve. Now, the whole inactive, well, can you, I don't know about placing me on the inactive. Listen, listen, we're just placing you there because ultimately you lied to God and the church because you signed a covenant saying you would do it and you didn't do it. Like, you, you did that. Like, you did that. Like, you knew. Kind of like, I can't believe they're repossessing my house. Did you pay for it? No. Did you sign a contract saying you would? Yes, and they're taking it. Like, you You agreed. And so nobody's getting kicked out, and we're not saying we don't have, you know, bouncers or anything like that or whatever. I'm just, I'm just saying you're called to serve. 
whether it's inside this church, whether it's outside this church, you're called to serve people. We're all called to serve people. We're, we're not requested to serve. We're called to serve. And we can offer the excuses all day long, but one of these days we're going to look at a God with fire in his eyes, and, and, and I wonder if the excuse you're giving to the church will be sufficient for a holy and awesome God. I'm just asking. We're called to serve. Now, let me tell you why I'm so passionate about this. Because I know something about you. I'm your pastor. And I love you. And I know that you will never become the person God wants you to be until you start serving. I don't want anything from you. Listen, you don't have to volunteer in this church. That's fine. Church is going to go on. Listen, I've had people, well, I won't volunteer in the church. You're talking to the guy that used to do all the setup by himself. I mean, I know what it's like to serve. I just know what it's done for me, and I know this for you. Until you're serving Jesus on a consistent basis, you're not growing. You're not developing. And I don't want for you to not be who God called you to be. He's called you. He's gifted you. He's empowered you. And you are too important to do nothing. My gosh, people, step up and do what God called you to do. Serve. I want you to grow in Christ. And you can't grow without serving. Now, here's what's cool. Because people go, I don't want to park cars. I don't want to greet. We've got so many service opportunities around here. It's not even funny. And on every campus right now, I'm about to turn it over to your campus pastor. So in Columbia, Alden's going to come out, who is a Carolina fan. That's all I got to say about that. John will be here in Anderson. Howard. Howard the Duck was a movie in the 80s. That movie should not have played. I mean, that was all. Anyway, Howard will be in Greenville. Michael will be in Florence. And they're about to walk out. And listen, don't leave. They're about to walk out and share with you how you can step up and begin to serve and a few other things that we've got coming up that are really exciting. But they're going to share with you how you can step up and serve. They're going to close the service we're going to go home, and then next week, we're all going to be right back here and talk about how to live the blessed life, a life that is far beyond our imagination. So let me pray on all of our campuses, and I'm going to turn it over to your campus pastor. Father, God, I thank you so much that in your word, it is so clear that we are called to follow you. And as we follow you, Jesus that you change us. Father, I'm so thankful, God, that your love for us is not in question, that we don't have to do any of these things that we've talked about to get you to love us. Father, but if we love you, we will follow, and if we follow, we will be changed. I pray for each and every person here today on every campus. Father, that we would submit our lives to you, I pray if there's someone here that does not know you, Father, that before this day is over, they will, they will come to know you. And Father, I pray for those of us that do know you, that we will take the steps that you direct us to take in order to follow you, in order to change how we need to, in order to be changed like you're leading us to be changed, rearrange whatever needs to be arranged, and Jesus just completely sell out to you on a daily basis. Thank you, Jesus, so much. We love you, and we ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, everybody still feeling good? All right, all right. My name is John. I'm the campus pastor here in Anderson, and we've got all kinds of good stuff as far as next steps that you could take in ministry with, here, with us at New Spring. But before I get into that, I've got to celebrate one of the most amazing Sundays that we've ever had, and that was last week. And we saw such a tremendous move of God, especially in this 6 o'clock service. I stood right up there and watched probably one of the most moving worship services that I've seen in a long, long time. And uh, it's just a great, 
great Sunday to look back on, especially because we had 311 people here at the Anderson campus that nailed it down and stepped over from life to death and accepted Jesus Christ. That's something to celebrate. Absolutely. We've got so many things coming up, and especially since we had so many of you make that commitment for Jesus Christ. We wanted to make it very simple for you to take your next step in being baptized. Now, if hopefully you got your bulletin on your way in. There's a card, and this is a very simple baptism sign-up. And every Sunday in September, we're going to do a baptism. And we'd love for you to sign up, put your name and information on this card, pick a Sunday that you can make it, and we'll call you and get you set up with the service time that we would love to baptize you at. So go ahead and, and put these in the offering buckets, and the pin buckets, excuse me, as you go out, and, along with that pin that you are not going to steal, and uh, we'll get this from you. But we'll get you set up, and that's anybody who has received Christ lately but has not followed through with baptism. So if that's you, go right ahead. And also, we want to make sure that you are equipped with a Bible. So as you go out today, uh, if you do not have a Bible, there will be tables outside to where we've got Bibles set up. And we want you to have one of these so you can go ahead and get um, started with reading an amazing book in this right here. And uh, we're going to give you a little bit of help as you get started reading there are one of four reading plans. There's a 21 day all the way up to a full year of a reading plan. And you can just take this, slide it in your Bible, and use it daily to prompt you as to what to read so you can get uh, more and more uh, in-depth into what the Word has to say specifically to you. So grab one of these. You don't have to grab all of them, but just grab the one that makes the most sense as to what would work for you. And those are also going to be on tables as you go out of the door today. But... You know, if you're making even more steps, if you've been here at New Spring for a while and you need to go ahead and get involved in a group or you need to come to our ownership class, you can do that at guest services. You can sign up for those two processes. And if you come to an ownership class, that's just going to let you know a little bit more about our church and a little, little more about what volunteer opportunities are available here on a Sunday or if it's at Fuse, it's going to be on Tuesday and Wednesdays with our students. But that's uh, where you can get involved in our kids' ministry or any of our other guest services. And speaking of kids, you all like my Kids Spring shirt here today? Yeah. I've got an a eight-week-old at the house, so she's going to be getting into Kids Spring here in a minute, so I had to rep the Kids Spring shirt. But, you know, what we want to do is to find your exact fit here at the church, but also something you got that was on your chair. Get out this little card right here. This says, Volunteer Oppor Opportunities. On this card, you'll find 10 examples of opportunities in our community where you could get plugged in, you as an individual or as a part of your home group or as a part of your volunteering group. Use this as a guide to find some areas where that you would feel passionate about. And you can plug into these organizations. There's a little blurb about each one of these and the contact info. Just ring these places up and ask how you can get involved with their organization. And somebody in the first service came up to me and said, well, I live in Greenwood or I live in Clemson and, you know, there's nothing about Greenwood or Clemson on here. Can I still get myself involved in the Greenwood soup kitchen? Absolutely. This is just a guide for our community. But the point is for you to become the church outside of these walls as well. There's so many people here that can do so great in their giftings if they plug into one of these great organizations that do work and that share Jesus Christ outside these walls. So we want to just make that available to you and just encourage you to do whatever you can to share Jesus outside of these walls as well. So that's volunteering in the walls of New Spring and outside. And one last thing that I want all of us to get really pumped about, and that's this paper bag you have under your chair. What we're going to do for next week, I want you to fill this bag up with the the list of things. Now, you probably can fill it up with the canned goods, the meats, and the veggie, veggies, and soup. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to stuff too many paper towels or toilet paper in there, but bring that along the side. We're going to take up, I want to fill up as many trucks as we could possibly fill up, box trucks of food to serve this community. We did this about two months ago in the, uh, the soup kitchen and, the, and AIM and all the others that we serve say, that food is gone. So, and this is a critical time from now until the end of the year where the holiday season starts. Our food pantries are really, really low. So we can do, with this many people, we can do an amazing work 
in our community to feed our community. So I want you to fill these bags up, bring them up next week, September 12th. And uh, we're going to take up an amazing amount of food. Y'all just load us down. All right, so guys, that's all I've got. Hopefully that's plenty. Hopefully you made notes on what is your next step. So do whatever you can do to uh, say hey to us. If you're new, visit us in the green room. Have a great Labor Day. See you next week. Thanks, guys.